Our scripture reading this morning is from Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 6 through 11. Romans 5, 6 through 11. I'll be reading from the King James. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. The God, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I think most of us probably are aware of the fact that tomorrow is Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a day uh, where we remember those who died in active military service. You know, as we go throughout our lives and enjoy many freedoms in this country that, that many people in other countries don't have, uh, tomorrow's a day where we remember that a large part of that is because there are those who are willing to, to fight on our behalf, to put themselves in, in dangerous situations on our behalf, and, and many people who, who lost their lives on our behalf. And, and I hope that tomorrow you are, and, and really more than just that, uh, but, but especially tomorrow as we celebrate Memorial Day, that you remember that and, and you be thankful for those individuals. It's an honorable thing uh, to die on behalf of somebody else. As a matter of fact, whenever I think of Memorial Day, I think of John chapter 15. And if, if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to open there. In John chapter 15, we're going to study three verses out of this chapter this morning. And, and it kind of goes along with this idea of, of dying in, in somebody else's place or, or dying in place of somebody else. In John chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, uh, this is the teaching of our Lord. And he said this, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You know, that really is an important passage, and I hope it's one that, that we can draw some really important lessons from this morning. As a matter of fact, what I want to do in the lesson this morning is point out four lessons that, that we should learn from this passage. The first one is this, point number one on your outline. Uh, we learn what love is. You know, when Jesus taught this and, and really commanded one another to love, one of the things we learn is that what he's talking about is not necessarily an emotion or an uh, affection. As a matter of fact, the, the way we use love and, and, and in a society and, and even in we as people, generally it refers to, to some sort of an emotion or affection that we have towards somebody. Interesting, and, and many of us I'm sure know this, that we have the word love and, and we use it in a wide variety of ways. But actually in, in the Greek language that the Bible is written in, there's, there's actually many different words used. And so uh, you might say, uh, as we would say, he commanded love and then he told another person love. And, and what he's saying is different things because it's, it's the same word in English but different word in Greek. And, and so we, we need to understand that. So, so I will say something like, I love my wife. And then I say something like, oh, I love my neighbor, right? Hopefully both are true, but I don't mean the same thing, right? I mean, I say, I love my kids and I love my friends. I love my, uh, the, my strangers and, and hopefully you love your enemies. But it doesn't always mean the same thing. Sometimes uh, the love we talk about is more of an affection. It's, it's more of, a, of an emotional bond uh, that we might have with somebody. I'm very affectionate. Uh, I have great emotion towards my children, towards my wife, towards my friends. But, but I love my enemies, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that there are people I want to hang around all the time. right? I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's somebody that, well, uh, I have a great emotional bond with. It really is more of a dedication that I have. 
that, that Christ is commanding here. The word he uses here is the most general word for love. It, it encompasses everybody. The love that he talks about here is the love that you should have for your wife. It's also a love that you should have for your kids. It's also a love that you should have for your parents and your siblings and, and for your brothers and sisters in Christ and for strangers and for enemies. It's a love that, that has to do with everything, everybody. It, it doesn't mean anything about emotion. It, it, it's talking about dedication here is what Jesus is talking about. And, and I think we understand that from, from what he's saying. I command you to do this. That's, it's really hard to command emotion. All right, I mean, how, how can I just decide to be emotional towards somebody or, or affectionate towards somebody? That's, that's not a choice that, that we necessarily can just switch on and off. But, but to treat people in a way that God wants you to treat people, that is a choice you have. You can be dedicated in, in doing that. The, the greatest passage, I believe, in, in the New Testament describes this love also comes from john but it's in first john first uh, john chapter 3 verses 16 and 18 it says by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him how does the love of god abide in him my little children let us not love in word or in tongue but in deed and in truth. See, what John says is, is this love is something we can know, and we know it because we saw the greatest example of it. All right, you, you don't need Webster's Dictionary to describe this for you. What you need to know in order to know this love is to know what Jesus did. What Jesus did describes it for us, and this is love. This is what love is all about. He laid down his life for us. That's what love is. I mean, if, if you want the definition of love, there it is. Jesus did something not for his own good, but for your good and for my good. For, for the good of, of all the people in the world. That's what love is about. It's about acting in a way that's not selfish. It's about acting in a way that's not self-centered and not focused only on me. But it's about acting in a way that looks at other people and says, I want good for them. And... And if that means that I have to sacrifice in order for the good of others, then I'm willing to do that. As a matter of fact, he would go on in that passage we just read to say, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in needs and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? See, it's not even necessarily just about laying down your life. It's about other things as well. It's about seeing somebody... And in particularly, he's talking about a brother or sister in Christ in this passage and seeing somebody who's in need, right? Uh, so, somebody who doesn't have food on their table. Somebody who's freezing and they don't have a jacket. And, and you have the ability to help them. You have this world's goods. You have, you have what you need and plus some. And you see that person who is in dire and desperate need and, and you shut up your heart from them. You, you just don't help at all. And, and John asks, how, how does the love of God abide in that person? The, the answer is obvious. It doesn't. It doesn't abide in that person. If, if you see somebody who is in desperate need and you have everything you need plus some and you're not willing to help somebody who's in need, not necessarily somebody who just wants something, somebody who's in need and you don't help, then, then you don't have the love of God. That, that's not what the love of God is because the love of God is this. He saw you in need in dire need. You could not be saved from your sins. You had no hope. You were lost in this world, and there wasn't a thing you could do about it. But Christ could. He had what you needed, and so he gave it. That's what love is all about. And, and as we talk about our passage from John 15, the idea that he's talking about is, is putting your life, or dying, in somebody else's place. That's the greatest love that there is. When you talk about doing good for something, there's no greater love than that, than to, than to, to lay down your life for a friend. That, that, that's the greatest love that there is. And so we talk about Memorial Day. Um, we, we see love in somebody putting themselves in harm's way for your good. That, that's love. Maybe you think about, uh, as, as a father, I, I think that, 
It's never happened to me, and Lord willing, it never will. But, but I, I tell you this, if, if, if some night my family's all in bed and we're sleeping, and somebody breaks into my house, I'm not going to say to my wife, hey, get up and go check. Right? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell my little kids, hey, hey, go, because I know it'll be putting them in danger, right? And, and I love them, and so I'll say, I'll go. I'm going go, I'm I'm to go put myself in danger because I want them more than me to be saved. Uh, that, that, that's the idea that, and I think I'm not the only one here, that's what love is. Right? There's no doubt in my mind that, that most mothers in here would jump in front of a speeding car to push their kids out of the way. To, to save their kids, right? And, and, and fathers would do this. That, that's what love is all about. And so understanding that, we launch into our next three lessons. The next one is this, point number two, that we must love one another, right? It's, it, it does us no good to know the definition of love, to know what Jesus is talking about if I'm not going to then act on it, right? Uh, I have to love one another. And notice that it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Jesus commands you to, to love people as I have loved you. It is what he says. He says, this is the, my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. How has Jesus loved us? He laid down his life for us. I mean, he, he sacrificed for our good. Jesus says, that's what you need to do. That's what I'm now commanding you. Don't, don't be about self. Don't be about what's, what's good for me. Think about others. Think about what's good for others. When you act, when, when, you, when you practice the things you practice, when you do the things you do, let this be in your mind. What, what's good for others? What's good for my brothers and sisters in Christ? Think about that. Think about it before you speak, before you act, before you do something, before you don't do things. Think about how is this affecting other people? If, if I'm so caught up in, how does this always affect me? Then, then I'm missing the point that Jesus is saying. I'm, I'm not being the person that Jesus wants me to be. It, it's hard. As a matter of fact, I, I would suggest that this is probably the hardest commandment in all the Bible. Is, is to really be this way towards other people. The natural inclination is to say, hey, uh, that doesn't benefit me at all. Or, or, or why would I do that? Or I don't want to do that. Or, or it's not comfortable for me. Or, or I, I don't like doing it. It's a natural inclination to think, what do I want? What's good for me? What's encouraging to me? What do I like? It's natural to be about self and me, 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 me. And Jesus says, no, I command you to be different. I command you to be different. You can't be about self all the time. You have to love as Jesus loved, which, which brings us to our next point. We learn how much Jesus loves us, right? As, as you think about that, you think about the degree to which he loves you. I, I really want you to contemplate that and, and really consider it because he said this in verse 13, greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. I want you to think about love. And I want you to think about Jesus. And I want you to realize this, that there is no greater love than the love with which Jesus loves you. You realize that? I tell you, if that doesn't make you feel important, if that doesn't make you feel special, if that doesn't motivate you to, to love him in return, I don't know what's wrong because what I'm told here is that Jesus the Christ, uh, the Lord of all, King of glory, loves you with the greatest love that there is. There's no greater love than that. I mean, what, what could be greater? If we're talking about love as the idea of sacrificing for somebody else, what more could you sacrifice than your life? There's no more. I mean, if, if you were to ask me, what's, what's of, of my possessions, what's more valuable than my life? I'd say no, no, no possession of mine is more valuable than my life. I mean, you, you could wipe out my savings account or, or take my, well, what good is a savings account if I'm not alive, right? I'd, I'd rather have my life than my savings account. You're talking about, about, about my car, I'd take them, all right? I mean, uh, my life is more important than that. Uh, I like those things. I'd, uh, they, they bring a, a degree of comfort to my life, and, and there's things I enjoy about them. There's nothing inherently wrong with them. But none of those things, there, there's no physical possession on this earth that I'll say I'll give my life for. 
Why, why would I give my life for any kind of inanimate object or, or anything that I like that? He asked me, will, will you lay down your life for your kids? Yeah, I would. That's how important they are to me. Would you lay down your life for your spouse? Yes, that's how important. And, and, and we can understand that. And you think about all the things in your lives. And there's people in here with, with varying degrees of, of, of things and possessions that they own. But what possession is more valuable than your life? None. And so if you're willing to give your life for it, you, you have to really, really love it. It has to really be important to you. That's the love that Jesus has for you. He laid down his life. He didn't just give some money. And he, didn't, he didn't just offer some, some thing. He gave himself. Now that, that's love. And, and that's the love that Jesus had. Now, th- this next point is, is very important for us to understand. Uh, how can we be the friends of Jesus? You know, it, it's, it's important that we understand this. It's, it's an interesting passage and it's an important passage because it teaches us that Jesus' death does not profit everybody. You know, there's a very real sense in which Jesus died for even his enemies, right? Even those who would, who would pin themselves against him. Even those who would hang him to the cross. Even those who today are, are careless and, and, and don't care about the fact that he died. Even then, Jesus died for Right, I mean, was the passage we read in our scripture, Romans 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The world there is described as is the people of the world, every individual of the world, Jesus the Christ died for. So there's a real sense in which Jesus died for everybody. But, but there's another sense in which he really died for his friends. You know, Jesus died so that even his enemies could come to him. But if a person remains an enemy of Jesus and opposed to Jesus and, and never becomes the friend of Jesus, then, then Jesus' death does not profit them. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus said that because he just commanded that type of love from one another as he had. Jesus, in a sense, died for his friends. But then he said this, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. See, Jesus died for the whole world in one sense, but in another sense, he died for his friends. Only his friends will benefit from it. Anybody could be the friend of Jesus, but only the friends will benefit from it. Only his friends will, will have their sins washed away. Only his friends will, will be saved from their sins. Now, if you're not a friend of Jesus, you can become one because he died for everybody. But if you don't become one, then you're not a friend of Jesus. And, and if you're not a friend of Jesus, you can't have your sins washed away. Jesus' is death is for those who would become his friends. And you can become his friend like this. He says, and you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So if I reject Jesus my whole life, and and Jesus has commanded me certain things, and told me to live in a certain way, and and told me to treat people a certain way, and commanded me to love one another, and and commanded all kinds of things from me, and I say, no, I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not interested. No, I'm living my life. No, I'm not interested in following him. I'm not interested in in believing that that he's my Lord, or that he's my master, uh, that, that, that he's my Messiah. I'm not interested in following him or or hearing him or believing in him or or because he told me to live a certain way to necessarily live that way. I'm I'm not interested in telling others about him. I'm not interested in it. Then then I'm not the friend of Jesus. I can't be his friend in that because only his friends obey his commands and his friends do obey his commands. I want to leave you with one more passage this morning and it's important for us to remember Jesus, after he, he walked this earth and he taught all the things that he taught, and, and after uh, men 
with lawless hands uh, captured him and, and crucified him and hung him on a cross. Uh, Jesus was buried for three days and for three nights, and, and he, he rose again. And, and he rose again, and after he rose again, he was seen by, by many people. Right? I mean, in 1 Corinthians, we're told that, that he was seen by Cephas and then by the Twelve and then by over 500 brethren at once. And so he, he was seen on and off at various different situations uh, for, for a while. But then he ascended up to the Father. Okay, And we read about that in Acts chapter 1. That he ascended to the Father and the angel saw these men gazing up into the heavens. They said, why are you gazing up into the heavens? Uh, don't you know that, that he'll so come in like manner as you saw him go up? So Jesus is coming again. But before Jesus left, before he ascended to the Father, after he had died, after he had been buried, after he had been resurrected, after he appeared, he, he still taught his apostles some very important things. One of the things he taught we often call the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, before Jesus ascended up to the Father, Jesus taught his apostles this. He said, Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. See, what Jesus taught is that his apostles or his disciples needed to to go make disciples, right? And, and he taught how to do that. He said, you make a disciple, first of all, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that, that was the command of Jesus, that, that by the authority of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you baptize people, and the purpose of that is for the remission of sins. That's what Peter reiterated in Acts 2 and verse 38. He said, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, that, that, that's what the purpose of baptism is. It's to take away the sins of man so you could be a friend of Jesus. You, you can't be his friend if, if you're covered in sin and living in sin. You have to have that sin washed away from you, and you have to obey his command to be baptized. And, and then you could be his disciple, and then you could be his friend. But, but also Jesus said this, not only do you baptize them, but you teach them to observe all that I have commanded. Right. Baptism is, is part of the equation. Baptism, baptism is the point in which you wash off that old man of sin, as, as Romans chapter 6 describes. Baptism is the point in which my sins are washed away from me. They're remitted, they're taken away from me. That, that's what baptism is. But, but that doesn't mean that my service to God is over at that point. I need to continue throughout my life to observe all that he has commanded. Right? That's, that's who the friends of Jesus are. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That's who the disciples are. They're people who have been baptized and they obey the commands of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus and a friend of Jesus, they're one and the same. They're the people who get to have their sins washed away. They're the people who get to go to, go to heaven and live with God forever. That's a friend of Jesus. That's a disciple of Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants you to be. You know, as we remember Memorial Day, very honorable thing to die in someone's stead. To die on behalf of somebody else. Uh, I hope you remember that tomorrow. I hope you're thankful for that. I hope as we all enjoy the freedoms of this life, we're thankful for people who have done that so that my, my earthly life can be much more enjoyable and much better. But I never, ever, ever want you to forget the one who loved you so much that he died on your behalf not just so your earthly life could be better, but so that your eternity can be better. So you can be with God forever. So you can enjoy the presence of God, the presence of the saints, so, so that you could live forever with God in heaven. If, if we could help you become a friend of Jesus this morning, so you could have that, uh, that's what we want to help you do. If we could baptize you so that your sins uh, will be forgiven, if we could... Uh, if you need to confess sin, we would love to, to pray for you, to, to help you get through the struggles in your life. If, if we can help you in any way become a friend of Jesus this morning, that's what we want to help you do. If we can, won't you sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing the invitation song?